And as you guys are filing towards your seats, um, I'm going to start introducing our panelists, um, starting from the right down there, and we'll work our way towards me. Uh, first, we have AJ Pepper. He is in the Doctoral Program of Educational Leadership, and he's currently enrolled in Master's in Public Administration, and he's a GTF for the Office of Institutional Equity and Diversity. And next to him is Dr. Jerry Rossick. He's an Associate Professor for Teaching and Learning Department, um, Teacher Education uh, of the College of Education. Next to him, we have Dr. Priscilla um, Ovalle. Uh, she's an Associate Professor for the Department of English. And then we have Dr. Scott Pratt, who's an Associate Professor for the Department of Philosophy. And next to him is Dr. Timothy McMahon. He's an Interim Development Specialist, uh, specialist for the Center on Diversity and Communication and Faculty Development here at the U of O. And next to him, we finally have the Honorable Cynthia Carlson, who is a Circuit Court Judge for the Second Judicial District for the State of Oregon. I'm going to now turn the mic over to Kevin Hatfield, who will talk about the bibliography uh, provided by the library. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that our collaboration with the UVO Library System is ongoing, and Elizabeth Peterson, a humanities librarian, and Barbara Jenkins, the head of the reference department, have been kind enough to compile an, another annotated bibliography for this evening's discussion. I'm going to be passing out a condensed version of that bibliography, and you'll notice at the bottom of the front page there's a URL to our Community Conversations Library webpage, where a more extensive version of this annotated bib will be available. Some of the panelists will also be referring to some additional material this evening that will add to this bibliography after the panel concludes. So if there's any books or other materials referenced tonight, uh, please visit that website for a reference. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Lou, who's going to talk a little bit about Count Me In, and uh, she's going to hand out a few items as well. So Lou? You, know, you need to project? Okay. But okay. Well, for the camera, yeah. Okay. Okay. So we can get you on film. Um, hi, I'm Lou Vijayker, an Assistant Director of Residence Life in University Housing, and so I'd like to add my welcome to Kevin's. Uh, Kevin and I, uh, along with uh, uh, all the other pro staff and student staff in housing, work really closely on a lot of different initiatives, and diversity and academic initiatives are certainly among the forefront. Um, one of the things about housing that um, we're really happy to have in initiated, one of our initiatives this year, was to um, start a campaign called Count Me In. And this is nothing new from the um, diversity initiatives we have done in the past. However, what we thought we needed was some kind of um, an umbrella, if you will, or um, um, kind of an overview of to include and to um, give impetus to all the diver diversity programming and activities we plan through the year and to help um, bring some focus into what we're doing. So we've done a Count Me In campaign, and um, one of the uh, kickoff um, spurs to that campaign was to uh, pass out and hand out to all our newly um, incoming residents a, a pledge card and a signature card, and then give them an opportunity to purchase um, a T-shirt for $8, and that's open to anybody in the university community. So we have those available for all of our residents and for anyone in the university community. And basically what the Count Me In campaign is, is to encourage all year long and in everything we do to make sure we're providing positive, inclusive, and respectful environments here in the residence halls and hopefully extend that into the community. Um, I wanted to highlight one of our student staff members who's actually used that and would gi it will give a brief synopsis of what she uh, did with the campaign. And then we will have uh, an opportunity to hand out those pledge cards and the signature cards if anyone here would like to sign one. And then if anyone at the end of the program would like to purchase a t-shirt, we'll certainly take that information as well. So thank you for letting me take the time. Nicole, you want to? Yeah. I missed that. 
Um, okay, so I guess I'm going to talk about what I did in the halls to try and incorporate the Count Me In campaign. And what I did was um, basically I took some empty tennis canisters and put some information about the campaign in there. And it's kind of like a tag game. So one person has the canister and they're supposed to tag someone else with it. So it kind of gets around to everyone. And everyone has the opportunity to take part if they want in the Count Me In campaign. So that's just one of the examples, I guess, that of what we've been trying to do and how we've been trying to get everyone involved on campus. And so um, I guess we're also looking for other ideas of other ways to incorporate it and get um, everyone in the residence halls to be involved. So um, you can always contact Lou if anyone has any ideas or anything like that. But yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of having already, uh, you know, been promoted so quickly. But uh, it's my first year here at UO, and um, so I'm happy to be here and sort of get to know you a little bit better. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about today uh, was about media studies, which is my area of specialty, race and representation in media studies. And I wanted for uh, my time up here to really get us to start thinking about how in Hollywood film and other types of visual culture, but um, you know, uh, Hollywood films in particular, racial representation has been organized according to these poles of whiteness and non-whiteness. So um, primarily uh, whiteness and blackness. And this hierarchy of representation is so ingrained that whiteness tends to focus to, to be a sort of neutral or non-race default in terms of representation. And uh, I'd like to actually quote a media studies scholar named Richard Dyer, whose uh, name I'll definitely add to the bibliography. Uh, he has a book entitled White, where he really critiques rep white representation in media studies. Um, and he, he says, at the level of racial representation, whites are not of a certain race, they're just the human race. So uh, that was one of the things I wanted to sort of put out there and get us to think about how um, in terms of representation, we tend to think about raced bodies as those bodies which are not white, right? So we think of raced bodies as black bodies or brown bodies or Asian bodies, but we tend to not really think about uh, what bodies sort of represent humanity or humanness, right? Um, so for me, I find it uh, really interesting that white performers, and we could think about you know, any number of stars, white, uh, white stars, how they've had the privilege of representing humanity and have traditionally assumed the central narrative position in Hollywood films. So we could think about somebody like uh, Meg Ryan or Tom Hanks and think about the kinds of roles that are available to them, uh, the sort of uh, massive amounts of roles that could potentially be available to them, and then think about do we have the same level of stardom for non-white performers, do we have the same level of Starting for somebody like uh, Tay Diggs or um, Will Smith is a you know one of the few black stars that we could point to that has the same caliber of career. But I think we'd ha be hard pressed to think of, for example, um, many Latino or Latina stars in the way that we could have a Meg Ryan or a Tom Hanks. And I think we'd be even more hard pressed to think of whether or not there are Native American stars at this point or Pacific Islander stars, right? So um, the challenge I think for us here is to really learn how to discuss how the representation of a group in, that has in our society served as something of an invisible default and how these representations um, from the beginning of cinema to the present have really had this central position and how all these other uh, racial representations have been organized around that. And how do we begin to talk about a representation that has had the privilege of presenting itself as simply human, right? What does that mean? And what does that mean for us uh, uh, as consumers of media, right? As people who take pleasure in these, uh, in these moments of escape, right? With uh, mainstream Hollywood films. And what does that mean for us, uh, not only as people seeking entertainment, but also as us here studying um, these images critically, right? So um, just to kind of give us a, an example of something that we could maybe build from, and I do want to be sh brief because I want to have time for us to discuss these issues maybe at the end. Um, so if we take, for example, romantic comedy as a genre, right? Uh, I, I tend, I love romantic comedies. You know, we could pick any genre, but let's stick with this one for a second. So, uh, you know, this genre tends to find humor in how male and female characters try to hold the upper hand in a relationship, right? So it's a sort of battle of powers. Is Meg Ryan gonna win or is Tom Hanks gonna win? We don't really know, right? Um, and when we think about these films and to use those two stars as an example, we could think about You've Got Mail, right? 
And when we think of that film, we could identify it as a romantic comedy. I'm going to go see the new romantic comedy, um, you know, You've Got Mail. But we would never really say, I'm going to go see the new white romantic comedy, You've Got Mail, right? It's sort of implicit in the description romantic comedy. Whereas if we were to say, for example, go see um, a film like Two Can Play That Game, which is also a romantic comedy, but uh, stars two African-American leads, uh, Vivica Fox and Morris Chestnut, we might qualify that film as we're going to go, I'm going to go see the new black romantic comedy, right? And so I just want to think about how, um, you know, those sort of qualifications really change the way that we think about uh, human, human beings and human representation on screen. You could think about another example, right? Um, Spawn, right? For those of you that are more into the superhero flicks, right? It's a, it's a, a black superhero as opposed to Batman, who's just a superhero period. period. Um, and these examples are, you know, we could think of many different ones, right? But I think that these uh, very briefly illustrate the Hollywood assumption that all viewers have, um, that which is whatever their racial identification, that we should all be able to identify with white characters, right, on screen. But the reverse is seldom true. So if we see a film with black bodies in the central narrative positions, we might, or at least Hollywood's tendency is to perceive that as a film about black people, right, and not something that we could all tap into to as a culture, as a nation. Um, and so unless a film makes a point of identifying or overemphasizing whiteness, its dominance and its centrality is really taken for granted. Uh, and for me, I think that that's a really fascinating place to start a discussion about the, the, the omnipresence of whiteness in, in our culture, right? Something as, um, as permeable as something that impacts us every day, which is media culture, right? And this, this is not just about the Hollywood screen. This is also about tabloid representations, which sort of take those Hollywood representations into the everyday moment, right? Um, and so for me, I, I think that those are some of the ways that we could begin to have a discussion about this and uh, really begin to critique what it means uh, in terms of power for one particular category of peoples to uh, represent all of us. Um, and so I would like to see where everybody th what everybody thinks about this when we get to that point in the, the discussion. Thank you. Um, I'm Scott Pratt. I'm from the philosophy department. And uh, my approach to this actually is sort of from a kind of more general perspective, because at sort of at work in the stuff that Priscilla was just talking about is the idea that we have categories that are meaningful that allow us to talk about things like whiteness and blackness and so forth, so as to put these, first make the problem apparent, but then be able to talk about things like who represents humanity and so forth. Um, Part of my work looks at uh, the history of American philosophy, and a key figure in the development of theories of race was the African-American thinker and philosopher W.E.B. Du Bois, who was born in the 19th century and lived long into the, uh, to, to the 20th century, dying in 1962. Du Bois was very interested in this problem from a variety of angles, but in the end, he shared, shares actually with Priscilla the same sort of concern, that whiteness becomes sort of the dominant way of thinking about humanity. And on his view, this is problematic. Um, I, I want to uh, give you a kind of argument that Du Bois offered to sort of serve as an antidote to what he saw as the problem of sort of a, a dominant white culture. Um, and, and it's a pretty old argument. Uh, in 1897, uh, Du Bois um, uh, gave a presentation uh, entitled On the Conservation of Races. And the idea was that he wanted to be clear about what a race was, and then he wanted to make an argument for the need to conserve races, that is, to not eliminate races, but actually to sort of foster them in a positive way, and not to see races as simply a consequence of sort of oppression and that sort of thing, but really having a kind of contribution to make uh, for all humanity. So in general, the argument that Du Bois offered was this. There is such a thing as races. They're intimately connected to people's selves. And in, in so far as they're connected to selves, and that they have distinctive histories and so forth, they have something to add to humanity as a whole. Now, this is sort of problematic from one angle, because of course you want to say, so what, what constitutes this category of race? Is it something that's genetic? Is it is something you can trace scientifically? Is it sort of uh, uh, like a, 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 an ethnic category, so it has to do with sort of how you dress and so forth? Du Bois actually offers a definition of race. I sort of want to offer it up, because it's a way of sort of seeing how he thinks that this category of race functions. And I'll just sort of read it so you get a sense. So in, in 1897, Du Bois defined race this way. He said, a race is a vast family of human beings, so it sounds like it has a kind of genetic connection, 
generally of common blood and language, always of common history, traditions, and impulses, who are both voluntarily and involuntarily striving together for the accomplishment of certain more or less vividly conceived ideals of life. So, just to recap, uh, his idea is that, that individuals are associated with races where races are understand, understood as a particular past, a shared common culture, and a common sense of the future. Right? So uh, in, a, in effect, a race is something that, that human beings grow into, and then it sort of gives them a sense of the past and a sense of the future and so on. Now, he thinks in the end that it's very important to conserve the races, and I want to read a passage that sort of gets at this because it's kind of interesting to keep in mind. Where is it? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, in 1903, Du Bois published a book called The Souls of Black Folk. Um, many of you have read this. It's sort of a standard uh, piece uh, in literature classes and so on. Um, in the first chapter, uh, entitled Of Our Spiritual Strivings, Du Bois ends the chapter saying something that was, for the time, pretty surprising, but it's consistent with this view that there is such a thing as races and that they have value as races. Um, so here's the, the passage. Du Bois says, work, culture, liberty, all these we need, not singly but together, not successively but together, each growing and aiding each, and all striving toward that vaster ideal that swims before the Negro people, the ideal of human brotherhood, gained through the unifying ideal of race. The unifying ideal of race, kind of an interesting claim, right? Uh, the ideal of fostering and developing the traits and talents of the Negro, not in opposition to or contempt for other races, but rather in large conformity to the greater ideals of the American Republic in order that someday, on American soil, two world races may give each to each those characteristics both so sadly lack. And so this is an interesting claim. Du Bois thinks there are races, they're valuable, and they have something to contribute to each other. And he even calls race a unifying ideal, which is not something we would normally mm -hmm. right, think of. So, so Du Bois is this idea that human beings have to be part of races, we have to recognize that, and we have to find value in it but there's a problem, and you already know what it is because Priscilla's made it clear, right? Um, if it's worthwhile conserving races, it's worthwhile conserving the, you know, the black race, and then he's got actually a list of eight races that's uh, important to conserve, one of them turns out to be uh, the white race. The question is, is Du Bois arguing then that if race is valuable, we have to conserve races, but we also have to conserve white races? This raises the question, right? I mean, in the end, are we, are we stuck with this sort of problem where there's one race that becomes the sort of dominant one and so on? And Du Bois had an answer to this. He thinks no, in fact, conserving the white race is a mistake because he thinks the white race is not actually a race at all. So he actually offers a kind of counter definition to the notion of race. And I, I want to read a little bit of how he talks about this. Um, he says in uh, a paper later, um, in 1919, Du Bois wrote this paper called Souls of White Folk, which is a kind of counterpoint to Souls of Black Folk. Um, Souls of White po Folk was written in the wake of World War I. It's a very angry piece, and for plenty of good reasons. Not only was the US involved in a, 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 a war, but all of the world was involved in a war, which in the end, Du Bois thought had most to do with a question of dominating places like Africa and India. So he, unlike most stories about World War I, he thinks World War I was actually about imperialism, not about some battle over Europe. And as in the wake of this, of course, among other things, African-American soldiers returned to the United States and were denied veterans benefits. And in the summer of 1919, actually, there were race riots all across the country and hundreds of African-American veterans were killed in the context of demanding their rights um, as a result of their service in the military. So Du Bois said, look, this is crazy. I have to be clear about the notion of what whiteness is and we have to be honest about what it's not and what has to be done about it. So he, he says, in the context of souls of white folk, he asks, uh, what is whiteness? Um, but what on earth is whiteness that one should so desire it? because uh, obviously, I mean, it's a dominant kind of view and people seem to want to hang on to it and so forth, but what is it that they want to desire it? Uh, then always somehow, some way, silently but clearly, I am given to understand that whiteness is the ownership of the earth forever and ever, amen. Whiteness 
turns out to be a particular kind of relation to everything else, in, in effect, owning everything else. Right? Now, the difference between this and what a race is, is a race has a history and a future and a shared culture. Whiteness doesn't have a history. It doesn't have a future. It doesn't have a shared culture. It's, it's ownership. Right? It's an economic relation to the world itself. So, and then, and then just to, to sort of put a slight gloss on this, he, he then adds um, a description that identifies, I hope I wasn't lost it, a description that identifies whiteness with, where is it, with Europe as a whole. Hmm. Planning in advance. I put a marker in there. This. Okay, this is a really striking paragraph, all right? Uh, now remember, he's writing about in the wake of World War I, and he says this. As we saw the dead dimly through rifts of battle smoke and heard faintly the cursings and accusations of blood brothers, we darker men said, this is not Europe gone mad. This is not aberration nor insanity. This is Europe. This seeming terrible is the real soul of white culture, stripped and visible today. This is where the world has arrived, these dark and awful depths, and not the shining and if ineffable heights of which it boasted. Here is whither the <clears throat> might and energy of modern humanity has really gone. Right? The idea is that Europe, or whiteness, right, is a kind of thing which isn't a culture itself, but it's a destroyer of culture. Right? It eliminates the differences that people bring in favor of one giant system. Now, of course, one version of this is actually turns out to represent all of humanity, for example. For Du Bois, it also meant that those people who didn't manage to be white ended up being subservient to the larger cause of essentially kind of turning the world into one thing, just a giant thing owned by a particular group of people for its own sort of future benefit and more ownership. So Du Bois' answer, this is actually, a lot of people talk about this is the paradox of race. If you conserve race, you have to conserve whiteness. Du Bois said no, you, you have to conserve race because race is what makes people in part what they are. It gives them a history and a future. <clears throat> whiteness actually undermines all of that and leaves people without a history and a future. And so, of course, he then wants to mount a, a, a response to whiteness that, tend, that aims to undermine whiteness, not just as a kind of way of thinking about uh, uh, race, because of course it's not, but also as a kind of economic relationship that ends up undermining the possibility of people having their own communities and so on. Right? So the, the purpose of all of this actually is to suggest you can't talk about whiteness without talking about race, but when you talk about race, you have to figure out what the relation of race is as a part of identity to this thing that we call whiteness the kinds of privilege we take advantage of, the kind of economic structures that are imposed, and so on. And Du Bois saw all of this, and in the end, by the way, he ended up not faring so well as a result. In the 1950s, Du Bois um, uh, believed that it was important to represent um, alternative economic systems, including communism in the United States. So he set, up, he set up an information office in New York where he had information about the Soviet Union and so on. The FBI raided him. He was 89 years old. They arrested him took him to jail, uh, took away his passport. When he declared he wanted to leave the US, he had to go to the Supreme Court to get his passport back. He did. He left the US, he traveled around the world, and ended up becoming a citizen of Ghana. And there he stayed until he died. And he died, in fact, the, the, the day before Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech. And in fact, just before Martin Luther King Jr. stepped up to give his speech, one of his aides came up and said simply, the old man died. And the old man in this case was Du Bois, who'd been fighting for nearly 100 years um, for uh, recognition of the value of race and the need to undermine what had come to be understood as whiteness. So uh, that sort of frames the present day concern, which is how we represent <coughs> whiteness and humanity. But it also raises the question that we can't have that conversation unless we think about the history and character of races and how they relate to whiteness. Hi, my name is AJ Pepper, a doctoral student in educational leadership. Um, and I would just like to say I applaud all of you for being here. I know when I was an undergrad, I didn't necessarily get engaged into many of these issues well until, uh, well until my grad year. So I think it's really great that a lot of you came in here tonight. 
Uh, the work and the subsequent research that I, I focus on it are issues of student engagement and student retention on campuses, predominantly students of color. Uh, and what you see on the screen in front of you is a widely cited model of uh, student retention put forth by Vincent Tinto, uh, initially put forth in 1975, refined in 80 or 87 and 93. Uh, and basically what it is, it's a, it's a longitudinal model uh, depicting t over time uh, what happens to students as they uh, enter the, the institution. Uh, as you see here, the pre-entry attributes, things like family backgrounds, skills and abilities. Uh, then we go into things such as uh, their intentions to, to go to a university. So let's say they want to come to U of O, I want to be a duck. They have that strong commitment and desire to graduate from the U of O, which then parlays into such things as academic performance, interactions with faculty, staff. So uh, all these type of things, academic integration, social integration, things that uh, students engage in, and uh, it's how, they, uh, how this model says students make their decisions about whether to stay or to leave. Um, so some of the, uh, some of the issues when, when we're looking at this model as far as uh, in social research, education research, and how, how it applies to various groups, uh, th this model was based on uh, longitudinal data pr predominantly made up of white, traditionally aged college students. And so when the issue becomes when we try to apply the model uh, towards different populations, certain fundamental aspects of the model and how it was created or come about. So one of the, one of the issues that, I, that I've been looking at and I'm engaged in daily is, is this notion of rite of passage. So in the development of this uh, student retention model, you have uh, f from the pre-entry attributes into the institutional experience, you have students who leave their home and come to the institution and it's a form of rite of passage that's seen in, in society as, as a way into adulthood. And, and the problem that, that arises in doing this is that you have, uh, let's say for the white students at a predominantly white institution, the culture that they're going from and going into is relatively the same. And when you have populations of color, whether it be African American, Asian American, Latino, uh, Pacific Islander, the, the culture that they come from and the culture that they're trying to become engaged in are, are very different. And this model does not account for those differences and doesn't account for groups coming from a foreign culture seeking some level of acceptance into a, another culture. Uh, also, which parlays in, in, into some of this, the cultural framework of U.S. post-secondary education, just in how institutions were developed, uh, predominantly initially based in, at its inception to educate the social elite, white men, um, whether to become lawyers, uh, reverends, things like that. And so any notion even of women at that time at, at the inception of U.S. post-secondary higher education uh, wasn't even on the radar. Uh, the, the second point that I want to make regarding the model uh, is this, this notion of cultural suicide, and I can give you all the quotes and articles if you want to read all this stuff. It's really quite fascinating. Uh, one way that the, the model accounts uh, for, for students of color, other populations that don't fit into how this model was constructed, is this notion of cultural suicide. So let's say for someone like myself, who, who I want to be successful and fit into the, the, the university. Um, Things such as breaking away from past familiar relationships, past friends, uh, this, this notion of th that I have a, a culture, a relation, a history with them needs to be taken away. And for me to be a, a successful student at a predominantly white institution, I need to cast them away and engage and become fully immersed in this new culture of the institution. So where some of my research <coughs> looks at some of these institutional experiences, things that the institution directly has control over. So things like academic performance, faculty, staff interaction, extracurricular activities. And it's interesting, if, if you were to take the African American population, for example, when you look at historically black colleges and institutions, a lot of the issues that come about at predominantly white institutions, such as uh, engagement with faculty, people that look like them, are, are relatively ameliorated because the students can see themselves uh, reflected in the faculty. But what's also is engaged in those historically black colleges is that they uh, nurture this, this notion of culture and history, and that they're, they're not just people there that are, that are letting themselves be reflected by the students, but are actually letting the students be engaged culturally and, and fostering that sense of culture and history. So where you kind of see the, the different colored markers is where I, I look at and how institutions can respond and be proactive uh, in not necessarily doing away with the culture, the, the white culture that is the institution, but how they can foster multiple pockets of culture within the institution that students can engage themselves in and then interact uh, between groups. And yeah, so that's a little bit about what I'm doing. Uh, and it, also, one thing I wanted to point out 
is that a lot of these models and, and a lot of when we get engage uh, different populations of color and, and how we can get them and help them be retained in successful institutions doesn't account for mixed race students. So when we talk about mixed race students, other issues arise as far as how we get them engaged. Uh, and even in some of my research that, that, I, that I've been looking at, I would even be omitting myself from my sample population because I'm of mixed race. And so when you look at Asian Americans, Latinos, African Americans, uh, there's so many, so much variance in, in, in the cultures and the history people bring with them that it, it does a disservice, I think, to just try to place one blanket model to apply to everyone. So, thank you. Great. I don't know what I have to offer in addition to um, a lot of the critiques that have been um, provided already. Um, I understood my charge a little bit differently, and that's probably because I don't read my emails closely enough. Um, but uh, I combined the unbearable whiteness of being with a focus on um, critical um, race theory, along with what I think was in one of the emails, which was a request for me to talk about a subfield of critical race theory known as critical white studies which is really analyzing um, closely how whiteness itself as a construct is, is produced. This is a really relatively recent development and somewhat controversial, even within inside of the field of critical race theory. So I'm going to try and give a, offer a few words about critical white studies. Um, and the way I'm going to do that, um, at the risk of being pedantic, is to um, just break out the three words and talk first about what critical means, um, then what white means in that phrase, and then what it means to study um, this kind of phenomenon. First, the word critical. Now, we can do a lot of things with that word, but um, in, by my read, the phrase critical, when I see it in academic literature, when I see it in literature that looks at sociology, anthropology, cultural studies, and philosophy, the word critical signals to me a particular kind of analysis. Let's talk first about what it doesn't signal. It doesn't mean to criticize or to be annoying and nitpicky about some aspect. Now, you might call somebody else overly critical, and you're talking about that in sort of a common sense way. That's what it means. But that's not the way it's used here. Here, critical means examining an ideology that underlies a topic. OK, so standard professor move is to define one word using a more esoteric word, and then I'll explain what it is. So what is ideology? Um, ideology, and I'm not going to get myself in deep because I'm sitting next to a cultural studies professor and somebody who does organizational theory and a philosopher and other um, scholars, and um, they're going to debate what the word ideology means. I'm going to give you the version I would use in a class. Ideologies are ideas that obscure our view of reality. Ideas that prevent us. They don't illuminate reality. They actually prevent us from seeing the reality that's around us. Um, for example, the idea of a meritocracy in our society. The idea that if you work hard right, and are moderately talented, that you will be rewarded in, in proportion to your effort for working hard in our society. There is some degree of functionality and truth to that. I mean, you can get further ahead if you work really hard. But if you frame everything you see through the conception of a meritocracy, then you start to give people a lot of credit for things they haven't really done for themselves. And Richard's famous um, assessment of George Bush in the governor's race for Texas was that he was born on third base and thinks he hit a triple. Right? So there, there's a problem with the uh, idea of a meritocracy on the privileged end. There's also a problem with the idea of meritocracy on the end of the, our social spectrum where people are not so privileged because you look around and see somebody who uh, didn't have the grades or necessarily the funds to uh, get into the University of Oregon. You go, well, that's your own fault. You didn't work hard enough. You didn't pay enough attention in high school, and you're not going to really be able to get here. And that explains I'm here because you know, I did work hard, and I deserve my position here. That explains part of it, but empirically, it's mainly false. Individual effort doesn't explain most of the social stratification we have. However, and most people, and I would guess if I asked most of you, you'd go like, yeah, okay, we know that. I've had a sociology 101. But it's one thing to know it as sort of a kind of commonsensical fact. It's another thing for it to be part of the public discourse. It is difficult to talk about social stratification in our culture because the ideology of meritocracy is so <coughs> pervasive in our public discourses, in the media, et cetera, et cetera, that it becomes a way, a, a form of thinking that obscures our ability to talk about another aspect of reality, which is social stratification. Gender differences, same thing happens there. We can do something, since we're not being terribly active here, this will have some degree of risk, but I, I want to ask you to do something for me. Some of you have pencils. If you don't, just do this in your mind. 
and then I'm going to ask a question. I want you to free associate with four words I'm going to give you. Everybody ready? The first word is apple. First thing that comes to your mind, write it down and try to remember it. Second word is stop sign. The third word is parking garage. Parking garage. The last word is stairwell in a large building. OK, this may or may not work. Let's try it. <laughs> I would like to hear from the gentlemen in the room some of their responses. And I only want to hear responses to the last two terms. When I said parking garage, what did some of the men write down or what came to your mind? Never? never? <laughs> oh, we're never going to have a parking garage on this campus? <laughs> I'm new here, so I don't really know all that context. <laughs> Other responses to parking garage? Drug deals. <laughs> Drug deals, all right. No, not, I mean, men only right now. Okay. Train. Yes, sir. Car. Car. All right. Again, men. Stairwell in a large building. What did you write down? What came to mind? Mm -hmm. Metallic handrails. <laughs> Your dorm. <laughs> Couple more. Concrete steps. That'll do. Okay, now, from the uh, women in the audience, what did you write down in response to parking garage? Concrete. Concrete? Endless circles. Endless circles? Dark. Dark. Apartments? Apartments. Mm -hmm. Scary? Rape. Rape? What did some of the women in the audience write down for um, stairwells in large buildings? Rape. Isolated. Isolated. Multi-level. Stinky. Dangerous. <laughs> Stinky. 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 All right, so now let me ask a question. How many of the men in the audience, I mean, clearly what we have here is, is some degree of difference. It's never sort of uniform, right. but we have um, terms associated with threat with those terms, with parking garage and stairwell um, being voiced by women in the audience but not by men. How many people were surprised by that with regard to the parking garage? How many people were surprised by that with re in response to the stairwell? Right. My experience is in um, teaching classes and using that example is that um, while sometimes parking garage is a source of possible physical assault, is very visible, certainly to women, not all women, but some women, um, and to men. The stairwell example is often invisible to men, but it's fairly well understood, not surprising to um, uh, most women in the audience. Um, the question, the reason I raise this up, is this is how ideology functions as well. It doesn't just give us a way for talking about a phenomenon that, um, like poverty, and blaming people for their problems. It also makes certain things completely invisible to us. Women live in a world where stairwells and large buildings are threatening, and I was 35 when I would learn this, and I spend my time studying this kind of stuff. Right? I go to anti-patriarchy workshops for fun instead of going to the movies. And I was 35. Right? I live, I have a mother right, who was present when I was being raised, and, and uh, I spend time with her. I have a sister. I've been around women all my life, surrounded. How did I not know this? That's the function of ideology. I can be right next to people all my life and not know important features of their experience. All right, so critical means ideology. So what does white mean in critical white studies? Um, this is going to just is going to repeat, so I'll, a lot of things have already been said, so I'll move through it very quickly. When we talk about white in the phrase critical white studies, it doesn't simply mean skin color. It, it really refers to race as a social performance. 
It's tied to skin color, but it's much more complicated than that. Um, you know, categories of you may have the signifier of the skin color, but, ha but you have to earn your membership into uh, various communities. And we also have the kind of counterexamples. You know, some years ago, Toni Morrison referred to Bill Clinton as <coughs> the first black president. Now, what exactly does that mean? Right? It, it signals to us that race is something more complicated than just the signifier of your skin. When Toni Morrison says things, she's a cultural prophet, you listen. Right? This is not just something like Jerry saying something like that. Um, racialized discourses produce our consciousness by forcing us to track how other people interpret our behavior. So it's not just that, that race is sort of slippery as a category, but we have to pay attention to it because it has consequences for us. I mean, um, Scott has already talked about um, W.B. Du Bois and his magisterial text, Souls of Black Folk, in which he self-described the experience of looking in a mirror and say, what does it mean to be a problem person? Where I am, have two consciousnesses. I am black, but I also understand how I'm looked at by white people. And that's a part of me. It gets into our heads. What's kind of new in the late 20th century, first 21st century, is that experience of being otherized, of knowing you're being tracked for that identity, even though it's not the way you think of yourself, is happening also to majority culture folk. Right? Men are being made more self-conscious about. Now, I'm not optimistic about this. I'm not saying that we live in a newly enlightened era. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that some of this is now being universalized. Right? Um, Peggy McIntosh, some of you take some of these anti-racist courses have heard her essay, The uh, Invisible Knapsack of Privilege. She kind of highlights what are the signifiers of privilege besides just your skin color, talking about the complicated construction of what it means to be white. Um, so uh, what really critical white studies means when we look at the white is examining whiteness as an idea. It means looking at how whiteness as a category of thinking obscures our thinking about other important realities in our lives, uh, prevents us from seeing what's really going on in front of us. I'll give you some examples from education. My field is, is education. I'm a new professor over in teacher education. Um, w in our field, the problem of racial differences and stratification education system has been around since the beginning of the educational system. Some people get educational benefits, some don't. How do we explain it? Early on, in fact, one of the founders of the Oregon public school system used um, theological deficit theories. Right? Savages, not Christian, you know, enlightened European Christians, we need to go uplift the savages. And it turns out we can't do it entirely, so we can sort of moderately fix their condition of savageness, but we need to keep our kids away from them because they will eventually corrupt them. This is in, built into the early documents of the Oregon school system. Now, we moved from a religious deficit theory to a genetic deficit theory. Right, being more scientific, so people have smaller skull sizes so they can't learn. Right? Then we move from being more enlightened from a genetic deficit theory to a cultural deficit theory. Well, everybody's physically, physiologically equal, they're religiously equal, but people live in states of cultural deprivation. So what we need to do is to go into communities of color and we need to take those kids and give them some culture so they can understand academic values, understand literacy, and become more like us. But we never theorize us. We just know what they have to be. That's the ideal, being more like us. Um, my point here is that these, that these constructs of deficits, those others being less and us being more, are a function of um, an invisibility of who we are to ourselves. We haven't critically analyzed what our category is. And so what we do is we assume everything else is less than us and try and move it to become more like us, to be more like sameness. So, that's an ide the ideological function of whiteness in that situation is whiteness is invisible to us, but it functions to obscure the reality of the oppressive colonial nature of our interactions educationally and otherwise with other people. All right, so that's whiteness. So what do studies mean? So critical white studies. To study whiteness is to study whiteness as an idea and an ideology. And I think we should talk about what it doesn't mean first. It doesn't mean a license for narcissism for white, white folk. Um, and it doesn't mean hand-wringing performance of guilt around issues of race when that comes up. And, and you can talk about whether you think guilt is, is um, required. I mean, but I operate from the position that we exist, all of us in this nation, with blood up to our elbows. And any decent high school text, history text, will reveal that to you. So our challenge is what to do with that history 
and all the meaning that cascades down from it as a result. Um, I don't see this as a cause for despair, it's just a simple reality and one we can reasonably expect intelligent adults to deal with. Um, so, um, a, a third thing it doesn't mean is that it doesn't mean establishing some sort of doctrinaire position on matters and trying to impose some sort of answer or, or um, a particular party line on what it means to be white. And what it means is conducting an earnest inquiry into the way the constructs of race operate in our society. And there's a history and a literature th around this which, which can be based, which has been referred to. Um, I'll highlight in, in the way of closing just a couple of particular debates going on now that you could be a part of is whether you believe the category of white can be preserved in a post-racist or an anti-racist society. Is there something constructive worth preserving in the category of white? It's called the preservationist view that we will eventually always have a category of whiteness and whiteness could do something positive. Or there's the abolitionist view, what Noel Ignatev, the editor of the journal Race Trader calls um, the new abolitionism, which is we have to get rid of the category of white altogether, which builds to some extent on W. E. Du Bois's work that, uh, that Scott was quoting there a minute ago from the uh, Souls of White Folk. White is a category that simply does damage. It has no constructive purpose. There are also questions about how race and whiteness interacts with other identity discourses like class, gender, sexuality, regionality, profession, your major. Turns out what major you pick will have an impact on how you think about your racial identity. Hmm. Math majors, it turns, think out differently about them than women's studies majors. I have my preferences for the ways in which different majors talk about it, but I'll let you make those decisions. Um, there are some people that say critical white studies is a waste of valuable critical energy that should be spent talking about um, marginalized communities. Um, you can make up your own minds. I would just say that the important contemporary debates about race aren't going to happen on CNN and Fox. They're going to try out a bunch of uh, threadbare conceptions of the challenges we face where race is concerned. The important debates are going to happen in your conversations late at night with other students who are excited about these ideas. They're going to happen in your classes and particularly in your electives particularly the new electives that are put on the, uh, on the curriculum, they're not yet part of your major, but somebody finally got them in as an experimental course. Right? If you look at your electives and just look at it as a way to sort of leverage a higher uh, grade point average by taking an easy course, you're really shortchanging yourself. Go look at the senior level courses in some of the high level seminars and jump into them, in my opinion, even if you're a sophomore and they allow you to do that, because you should use that time ambitiously to, get to become a part of the conversations that are most important things going on in our world today. Hi. Hi, thank you, <laughs> thank you. First of all, it's an honor to be here and thank you for coming out tonight. I'm Tim McMahon. I work on the Center of Diversity and Community and then also on the Teaching Effectiveness Program. Uh, a lot of my time is spent helping faculty and GTFs teach better and then also doing diversity related workshops. Tim Wise, a social activist, is quoted as saying this in his uh, piece, Membership Has Its Privileges. Being white means never having to think about it. James Baldwin said that many years ago, and it's perhaps the truest thing ever said about race in America. I'm going to offer a little bit of different kind of take on some things. There's a little handout going around, blah, blah, blah. One of the things that's interesting, when I've done different workshops and had folks split into groups, and I give them certainly permission to, to go to whichever group they choose to. Got white folks in one group and people of color in another group. And I give them this task. Come up with a list of what it means to be white in the United States. So if you imagine yourself in one of those groups, if you're white, imagine yourself in the white group. If you're a person of color, imagine yourself in the person of color group. What tends to happen, and this has been pretty universal whenever I've done this during a workshop, the white folks sit around and kind of laugh nervously and don't get anything down on the piece of paper in about 10 minutes. And the people of color work industriously, come up with a laundry list of things about what it means to be white. And then you get them together and you get the white folks together with the people of color and you pair them up in dyads or small groups and they share what they wrote. They share their impressions, and the white folks are usually quite amazed at the laundry list of things, the great list of things that the people of color come up with. Whiteness is generally uh, not examined, I think, and I think that that's one of the great reasons we need, we're having probably this panel and the need to think about that. A few years ago, I was doing a workshop uh, with some faculty, and one of the faculty members came up to me, it was a tech workshop, faculty members came up to me and said, you know what, we were doing a diversity piece, and this faculty member said, you know, I really don't need to be here. I kind of get this, this diversity stuff. I don't see color. So, you know, being fairly new to the campus, I said, so what color is my hat? I'm a Chicago Cubs fan. This is 1908. Last year they won the World Series. I wear this quite a bit. 
great example of white privilege. He's unique. He's a character. He can get away with that. So what color's my hat? She said, it's white. So I said, so you do see color. And she just scowled and turned and walked away and then gave us a bad evaluation on her final evaluation, said we don't know how to work with faculty. If you Google, I don't see color, one of the first hits you get is Stephen Colbert's website, <laughs> where you can purchase a t-shirt that says, I don't see color, but people tell me I'm white. You can also buy other t-shirts that are related to that. We do workshops now with, uh, in fact, we're doing one uh, later for faculty and staff, and we'll probably offer these next year for s students as well if, if they'd like to come. Is there a problem with the concept of I don't see color? Because you hear that a lot in Eugene. I don't see color. I don't see color. Cut people, they bleed red. We're all members of one race, the human race. And one of the perspectives that we've had for a number of years, or I won't say we, I've had for a number of years, is when we do that, we disenfranchise people. Because you never hear anybody say, you know, I don't see gender. You don't ever hear that. And so I think that one of the things that happens when we say to someone, sometimes quite well-meaningly, I don't see color when I look at you, we're denying some aspect of that person's humanity. So that's an interesting aspect I think it would be fun for us to banter about. One of my friends who used to live in L.A. County said, Tim, it's easy to be liberal in the suburbs. That's quite often how I feel at the U of O and in Eugene. Eugene is the meeting place for two uh, pretty opposite perspectives. You hear this from students quite a bit. For some students, this is the most diverse place they'll ever live in their lives. For other students, it's, boy, there's a lot of white folks here. And those worlds collide because they're both true. They're both true for the people for whom those statements are said. And so one of the interesting things that happens here, I think, is you have folks saying, it hasn't been very long since Brown versus Board of Education, and then you have other folks say it's been way too long and we ought to be a lot further along. It's already been mentioned about Peggy McIntosh, and if, if you haven't gotten into that stuff, I would encourage you to do that. When we think about this notion of privilege, uh, my dad was a high school principal, and I grew up pretty privileged, and I didn't realize that at the time, but now in retrospect, I realize it quite a bit, that one of the things I was afforded were books in my home and, and the, the just expectation I'd go to college, he was disappointed in me as an undergraduate student, and I probably should have been, but I wasn't. Um, but that was back in the day where you could get into grad school with a fairly mediocre GPA. You all can't do that. And so I hope that you're studying hard, and I'm glad you're out here tonight. But if we think about this notion of white whiteness, we think about this notion of privilege, one of the things that has informed me in, in my thinking, in addition to Peggy McIntosh's work, is the work of Chris Cullinan, who's on our campus and works in human resources and pre presents quite a bit all across the country. And she's got a wonderful model, I think, for privilege that's on this, the handout that I gave you. And she says that when, we have, when we're talking about privilege, she said there are three concepts that come to mind. There's this concept of innocence, worthiness, and competence. That if I come from a group that's privileged, and that could be white folks, it could be being male, it could be uh, being from um, another group that might be considered privileged. When we walk into situations, we can say, gosh, I didn't know that. I didn't know I must said those nasty things. Anybody see Gwen Eiffel on Meet the Press a couple weeks ago? If you haven't, go Google that and YouTube that and see her little snippet where she takes Tim Russert to task. It's brilliant stuff, and you've never seen Tim squirm. And I like Tim Russert, but you've never seen him squirm like Gwen Eiffel made him squirm in that conversation. So there's presumption of innocence. There's presumption of worthiness. In staff meetings, I'm assumed that people are going to listen to what I say. I've got a PhD, been in higher ed 30 years. Darn right people better listen to what I say. And I have colleagues with those same credentials, same expertise, and the same meetings they may not be listened to. So worthiness, competence, and innocence. Not only am I worthy of you listening to me, I am competent in what I say. And I think that those are great examples of things that we all just need to be aware of. I don't think we can give up privilege. Just Tim Wise does great workshops, and he came on campus a couple years ago. And somebody said, so what should I do if I'm privileged? Can I give up my privilege? He said, no. Your obligation is to be aware of that privilege and use it for the betterment of humankind, however you choose to do that. So just some thoughts for us to wrestle with. Um, I'm Cynthia Carlson, and I am a double duck. I graduated uh, in 1974 with a psychology major, and I went to law school here as well. And uh, I can also proudly proclaim that my two children have gone to the University of Oregon the last of the two is about to graduate this spring, so go Ducks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd be interested in knowing how many of you in the audience are, are students currently. If you could just raise your hand. 
and anybody from the community and any staff uh, faculty great um, I appreciate you being here also uh, and I really am thrilled to be in included in this uh, impressive panel and I came here because not I don't think because I had so much to share but because I have so much still to learn and I have learned new things tonight um, and I guess my perspective comes from being a member of this community I've lived in Eugene since 1970 um, I grew up in Salem so I'm a uh, Oregon born um, member of this community and don't have much experience with anything else uh, in terms of diversity, certainly not. It's interesting when I look back at my high school yearbooks from uh, McNary High School in what is now Kaiser, Oregon, I'm surprised to see how many students of color there were in my class that I just, they were, I was, uh, they were invisible to me when I was in school because we didn't associate together. Um, I have had the privilege of not having to think about race my entire life not not my issue you know felt bad for people that had to to be uh, dealing on a daily basis with being targeted by racism um, discrimination but it you know I always assumed goodness in myself one of those well-intended people who don't use pejorative words um, who wish no ill to anyone um, and have only learned in probably the last 10 years or so that that doesn't make me good um, that I am uh, I have inherited a legacy of every institution in this country being designed and made to work for people who look like me um, and if I do nothing if I'm just this benign gee isn't that terrible uh, wish it wasn't so uh, type person moving through the world the system won't change so there there are it's a new way for me to think about racism one being the racism of an individual or held by an individual the biases or prejudice against uh, people who are the other and the other notion which is more recent to me of the the idea of institutional racism and how to dismantle or change institutions so that they operate in the same way for everyone. And I think uh, particularly this is driven home for me because I am part of, a, of the justice institution. And it's incredibly um, important to me that justice mean the same thing for everybody, no matter what race they are identified as having uh, belonged to. And so I feel uh, an extra responsibility, not just because of the color of my skin, but because of the position I hold, both of which give me incredible privilege. And so I need, I feel that in order to still consider myself to be a good person, I need to proactively do something. I need to be aware. I need to learn. I need to um, speak up. I need to take action. Uh, and if I don't, then I'm part of the problem. So I, I like the notion, I agree with the notion that white folks shouldn't feel guilty about being white. Uh, it's not that we have no value. I think, uh, I, I like to think in terms of the notion that we are not responsible for history, but we're responsible to history. And whatever guilt may be generated um, along the notion of of discovering that whiteness isn't such a benign thing um, that um, in order to continue to feel uh, positively about myself I need to do something to change uh, the status quo I would really love to be able to go back to college and take classes that are available to you uh, as students today um, they may have been available. I wasn't aware of it. Didn't concern me. Didn't interest me. Didn't just didn't make it onto my radar screen when I was in in school here as an undergraduate. Um, I think gender was much more of a live issue for me because obviously, in terms of privilege, um, men had more privilege than women. Uh, when I was in law school, 25% of the 
uh, students were women and the rest men. And now I think it's over 50% uh, are women in, in the University of Oregon School of Law. So there's been a lot of change. I've been able to see that occur and, and more easily identify with that um, in terms of a, a social justice issue. I am involved in um, community efforts to have those important conversations, study circles on racism. Uh, we've, uh, a group of folks uh, have put together a discussion guide and ha are inviting people from all parts of the community and people who belong to and exercise power in institutions to take part in study circles on racism. It's a six week endeavor. They meet for two hours per week and they are facilitated by trained facilitators and I do the training along with uh, Dr. Phyllis Lee um, uh, for people to facilitate those conversations and those can lead to uh, incredible change for individuals. Um, I, I very much uh, liked the example that was given earlier about the how the experience of men and women can be so different when you, even when you're living together in a, a close-knit family unit. Um, I think that for the people of color who participate in the study circles on racism, they read the materials and they, s they sometimes in feedback say, there's nothing new here. <laughs> we, we know all this stuff, and yet the uh, European Americans in the group are, uh, I really liked and admired Molly Ivins, and she used the word gobsmacked, and that's a really great word. It's one of these kind of uh, moments, um, and it's just incredible to the people of color in the room. How could they not know? How could they not understand what we experience on a daily basis? Um, so I think that there's some usefulness in having those conversations um, with the hope that people will then be able to figure out ways to work together to change and become active um, um, in dismantling racism within institutions and uh, in, in other contexts. So um, I'm here to be a part of the, the community and kind of how some of this uh, plays out in in my life experience, and I'd be happy to, to talk to folks or respond to questions if, if any occur to you. Um, I would like to say too that it's important to um, acknowledge history, and it's important to acknowledge everybody's history. Um, and I was recently privileged to be part of a group of people who established a memorial at the Holt Center for the Performing Arts which is a location in World War II where Japanese Americans were required to uh, report to register prior to being transported to internment camps during World War II. And um, kind of interestingly, most of the ones affected in this area were students at the University of Oregon uh, that had to leave or be interned. So that's a way of um, remembering that history and teaching people, and it's not a period of history that I knew anything about from all of the education I got from first grade through graduating from law school. I didn't know anything about that. So I, I'm kind of falling awake at a late, later moment in life than I wish, and I feel like I'm playing a lot of catch up, that's why I asked to go last. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad that you're having an opportunity to think about these things at this point in your lives. Well, I just want to say we started about five minutes late, so we've got about 25 minutes for questions. And so what I'm going to do is pass around the microphone just so everybody can be heard. And we've got a lot of people nodding tonight. I just want to make sure that we have a chance to get everybody's questions in. So I just ask that if you could be succinct with your statement for your questions, we'd appreciate it. And feel free to, to, to ask a question for the entire panel or any particular <laughs> panelist. And just I'm going to <coughs> hand this off to the first person, and from there I'll just let you so who'd like to? Okay. Um, as opposed to asking you a question, I kind of wanted to touch base on what you said, Dr. Rosiak, and in regards to um, in regards to um, what you said was, if you look in any history textbook, you can see that we all share the same blood from. The thing, and I think metaphorically speaking, um, our blood within history textbooks is actually constructed to the contrary, in the sense that we are 
idealized as favoring white conceptual uh, Western conceptual conceptualizations of history, and so our um, in turn our um, textbooks extract vital information from what as students we need to learn. And that in turn retreats back to what you were saying as from elementary school, progressively you had absolutely no idea of different um, identities and what they constituted. And for that reason I think that um, um, the implications of primary, the extraction of this in textbooks within primary education is clearly, um, is clearly the perpetuation of the hegemony and in turn what um, what we construct as normative ideals of whiteness, and that's just what I wanted to say. Um, I agree. I, I think what what I wanted to say when I wrote down whether I said it or not was any decent history textbook, but my criteria for decent would be um, probably not the average history textbook. It's more like Howard Zinn's uh, <laughs> <laughs> People's History, which gets used in some um, history classes, but not most. Right. Um, so yes, I mean, you're right. Um, I was mainly making the point that if we're going to talk about whiteness and constructions of race and, and white people respond by staying in the place where they're shocked by the scope of what we don't know, then we're not really going very far. And a lot of classes can get, and a lot of people can get stuck there. Um, and I don't consider that a really, I don't consider that a, a space worth spending a lot of time in. And so I was trying to make some sort of offhand remark. And, but I would never give credit to our current conception of history curriculum in the K-12 levels um, for having really any um, sustained critical content. I think that happens a lot because groups and pockets and individual teachers with a commitment to that kind of critical work it, to do it. And they often do it at risk to themselves. Um, so my conception of a decent history class was kind of a rare one. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to make a comment. <laughs> Can I throw something in that relates to that? Too? Yeah. Um, years ago I was teaching a diversity kind of the theory class uh, for student affairs professionals in the master's program. And it went pretty well, but one of the things I realized pretty early on is this: many of the students in the class had no sense of history. So I changed the, the syllabus and the first thing they read was Takaki's A Different Mirror. Mm -hmm. And then things fell into place, but one of the most telling comments by one of the folks in the program who was a history major as an undergrad, got done reading the book, said, I never learned any of this stuff in my history major. As a major, he never learned any of that stuff. Granted, that was years ago, but it was just so telling. The, the, the foundation hadn't been laid. And quite often, if folks do take history, quite often it stops at World War II or it doesn't even get to the modern day. And history, I think, provides a foundation for all of this. Right, well also the illustration of Native Americans within textbooks is absolutely, I mean, I, I have absolutely no idea of the brutality that ha happened in the past and that is sequentially fueling the current state of Native Americans. That, I have absolutely no idea about. And I mean, that, that ill awareness leaves me absolutely confused as to what my identity constitutes as a white individual. And so that's just what I want to say. OK. Um, all right. Can you hear me? OK. Um, so I'm John. I'm from Nigeria. I've been in Oregon for seven years. Um, I haven't applied for citizenship yet, just so you know. Um, I I um I went back home in 2005. Spent a year back home. Now I'm a graduate student, studying public policy. Um, I went to a predominantly white college, Linfield College, for undergrad. Uh, I could count all the black people on my you know two hands. Um, literally, yeah, there were no more than ten. Um, and um, also, I direct the African Student Association um, here at the U of O. Um, and I just wanted to respond to Du Bois. Um, I'm surprised you read his um, definition, um, and I'm concerned as to if you believe what he says, um, because you sa he says that um, the white race is no race at all, needing no conservation. Uh, whiteness has no history or future, it's strictly economics. Um, that is, I would, I, looking at his background and where he's coming from, I think that's more of a reactionary statement. No thinking individual will um, will say that. Um, um, and I mean, for example, clear idea. Um, look at how much reparation um, the U.S. showed Europe after you know um, World War II. I mean, it was beyond rationality. You know, it was definitely a, a a deep solidarity that they were expressing 
in giving the loans without uh, you know much interest and you know transferring gold across you know the, the ocean. So um, I just wanted to talk about that first. Just mention that, and um, I have a few other things, but I think I'll just talk individually after it, um, tonight. So thanks. Sure. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, it's important that you you notice that Du Bois says that whiteness as a race doesn't have a history. In fact. Whiteness as a race is a relatively recent construction, um, something that emerged in the 19th century, late 19th century. And the, the issue for Du Bois is not that whiteness isn't anything. It's just not a race. It is a particular set of practices. It's a way of living that is highly problematic. I mean, this is, this is, this is what he wants to argue, that in fact, what whiteness ends up doing is taking a particular way of living in the world, which clearly as a way of living has a history, but it's not the same kind of history, he thinks, as the history of, say, African peoples. Or, I mean, from his perspective, he thought that, that uh, uh, Anglo-Saxons had history, whereas whiteness, that particular category, isn't a race that has a history, but rather a series of practices that leads to a certain kind of domination, leads to a certain kind of uh, uh, relationship that's fostered between races and so forth, but it itself isn't the same thing. So it's a in effect, it's a kind of category mistake to think of whiteness as the same thing as blackness or uh, 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 Asianness, whatever that would be. Um, it's actually something else, and the and the problem is it gets confused with being a race, and it and it needs to be criticized as something which is destructive in itself. Whereas races, he thinks, are not. Right. Uh, so that so I might I might not have been clear about it, but from his perspective, there's it. It's not the same sort of thing that has commonality of, of family or blood, it's doesn't have the same kind of commonality of language, doesn't have the same kind of commonality of vision or historical awareness. Right. I'll just say one yeah. quick thing. I'm from Africa, mm -hmm. and even within my nation, Nigeria, um, 150 million people, um, my, we don't have commonality of language yeah. and, and vision. No, I, did, um, I didn't say he was right about this notion of race. Okay, that's, good. That's the distinction that he wants to make. He, re he holds that there's something valuable about races and that races need to be understood just, just as you said, right, in terms of commonalities of these sorts of things. And he thought that whites didn't share that. I will say, however, from my studies that the commonality of the white race, if I'm going to use that word, mm -hmm. is the scientific revolution. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. is, that is the commonality. It's that, it's that way of life and that right. outlook that, See, that is, very, is very much... Right. you know, European, right. and has crossed over even and, into and here. And that's one of the things that Du Bois wanted to make a point about, because what it does is it ends up wiping out distinctive histories, languages, and so forth, in favor of just sort of one conception of the world, right? This notion that everybody is fundamentally the same, and they're all just like, well, you know, white people, right? I mean, at core, the ideal is the white ideal, and we can get this from science, right? Everything else is a sort of falling away of that same ideal. So you're right. I mean, this this is one for him. One of the clear commonalities: this sense of enlightenment science and so forth this is a way of getting rid of the differences that make for uh, the, the diversity that we experience. Right. So I, I you're, yeah, right. Good. Hey, hey everybody, want to say uh, I'm not racist at all. Some some of my best friends are white, as a matter of fact. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, real briefly, I just wanted to discuss a, a, a couple of experiences that, that I had growing up, just to let you know kind of you know how deep you know color is ingrained in our uh, in our culture. Um, when I grew up, you know, uh, I wanted really back. I really wanted long hair, right? And I went to the point where I would you know put all these you know crazy chemicals you know in my hair, uh, you know, to try to make it straight. My brother, who is um, uh, Dr. Rosick's color, right? wanted to even be, you know, lighter, uh, you know, than he was. And he would, we caught him bathing himself in Clorox, right? My sister, who's like your complexion, um, uh, she imagined herself as a, uh, as a white girl uh, named Stephanie, right? Uh, one time when I was in Maryland, I was, do, I was uh, doing door-to-door -door sales, and I, um, I had these black study guides, right? And, uh, you know, I started, you know, I, I kind of rounded up these kids, and I was trying to, you know, give them some black history. <coughs> and, uh, 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 you know, there must have been 20, 25 of them there. And one of the kids said, well, you know, when you look at the media, when you look at the magazine, when you, or when you look at all the movies, when you look at the billboards, right, he said, all you see, you know, is, you know, is white people. Um, she says, that's how we know God is white. 
and I was like, wow, man, you know, that's, you know, that, that's, that's really deep, you know, that's, that's really heavy. And uh, when I moved, uh, when, when I came here, uh, and I was surprised, uh, you know, I, I guess the one black studies professor had, you know, uh, you know, had moved on, he got a, you know, better position, I guess, at UC Berkeley or something like that. But there's really, you know, there's, there's not a, a lot of, you know, black studies classes here. Um, just even my few interactions, I remember the Black Student Union was having a, um, was having a function, and I invited some of my neighbors to go. And, uh, you know, so me, I'm, I'm used to being the odd man out in my classes. And uh, they were like, well, well, you know, we're going to be like the only two white guys at this, you know, at this dance. I mean, what, you know, what, there's no, there's no way I'm going to go. And I get, I'm like, come, you know, come on, man, we're going to show you love. It's no big deal. And, it, you know, I'm su it w I was surprised at how much kind of uh, fear and reticence there was, or, or hesitance there was at coming, uh, you know, at coming to this function. And, uh, and real, brief, real briefly, I, I wanted to kind of uh, um, close with these two points. There is a really deep divide um, uh, within, uh, uh, within American culture. One example um, that I spoke about last week that, um, that me and my friends are really wrestling with um, for the longest time was growing up in the 80s was the crack cocaine explosion that hit America. And within, you know, all across, um, uh, uh, all across within the black community, there was this, uh, um, and in the Hispanic community, the black community, we knew that, you know, where was this influx of drugs? Where was, it, you know, where was this coming from? And, you know, all of us within the community, we were all kind of our, you know, pointing our fingers at something's going on, you know, fishing in the White House, right? And, you know, it's, you know, it's one thing, um, you know, we, our pastors believed it. Um, our, you know, our leaders believed it. Um, you know, my grandparents, uncles, right? Everyone kind of had this feeling that our t communities were being targeted uh, by the drug trade, right? And it, you know, no one really listened to us until you know Mike Rupert um, and that, um, and there was another. Uh, I, I can't remember the, the name of the reporter that broke it uh, for the Mercury Sun, <coughs> but um, um, it was sometime in '97 when the story broke uh, down uh, in South Central Los Angeles, and. Um, for us in the black community, it was, you know, to kind of have finally some validation that, you know, this monstrosity was going on uh, in, in our community was, was refreshing. But to this day, it, it sounds so outrageous, right, even, even now, to mention that our communities, you know, are being targeted by the drug trade. But there's no, there's pretty much a consensus within the black community that that's the reality of it. And number two... Um, the second point is is Bush's you know election or his selection right first time around, um, everyone in the you know in the black community felt like um, we had deeply been let down, especially by the Senate. We couldn't you know there wasn't one person in the Senate, not one, who would back the black Congress right, um, and ask for a recount of votes you know that were you know that were ignored, and um, you know so now we find ourselves uh, in, in a situation where. You know, in our communities, you know, uh, um, you know, the schools are completely are completely segregated. Um, you know, there's so many more you know blacks and Hispanics you know that are in prison, uh, you know, that are in, you know that are in higher education. Um, you know, there's no money that are you know that's being funneled uh, uh, in our schools. And you know, when I was discussing this kind of this, some of this with um, um, you know the reality of COINTELPRO and so on and so forth with some of my some of my white friends. The reality of, of kind of like um, you know of what the Panthers were doing and so on and so forth and you know uh, and some of the civil rights um, leaders who were trying to better the situation and who had gotten marginalized or assassinated or exiled and so on and so forth, the idea is, is that well you guys kind of brought this on yourselves right um, and so it still seems like there's a huge divide and I don't even know where to begin to kind of uh, to kind of to kind of tackle this but it is good to see you know some different folks here you know coming out and beginning this dialogue. But I just wanted to kind of address those, you know, those really serious pertinent issues that I think is on, is on our community. And, that I, and I, I do not expect the media or Hollywood to address these issues. It's not their job to me, you know, to address, you know, dr to address those issues. So, but it's good that we're having this discourse. So I just wanted to say that. I wanted to make a comment about, um, you know, saying, well, whiteness is a more recent race. Um, I remember I actually was having a conversation with my friend who went to high school with me. Um, he's a student at OSU right now. But um, we're making comment when we took our SATs and when we took our AP history tests and AP English tests, and they have little information bubbles that you fill in. There's the one that says race, and I'll say like Asian American Chinese, Asian American Japanese, 
African American, Latino, and this is just Caucasian. And I just thought that it was, you know, they just lump your white into one thing. And uh, we were actually just talking about at what point did Caucasian become a race. Um, having that said, I wanted to address um, Dr. McMahon real quick. Um, I understand the viewpoints from the um, I see no color perspective. I can understand why people would, would say that. Mm -hmm. And then I also understand the importance in not um, destroying your culture mm -hmm. and the importance of realizing that everybody has a unique culture and not to let go of that. Um, given the two things, like identifying yourself as a human being, as I'm a human, you're a human, we shouldn't be treated any differently, is there a way to encompass what that is aiming at without destroying culture? So is there a way for us to identify um, as I'm a human, you're a human, with still respecting and identifying with your culture? Is that ever possible? It's a great question, and I'm sure folks would have different opinions on the panel. I think it's like anything else. I think when you talk about diversity, you've also got to talk about community. You've got to talk about how we're similar and how, how we're different as well, both. Mm -hmm. I think if you just talk about one, it's a false dichotomy. It's mm -hmm. trying to say it's this or that. Well, it's both. We got to talk about how we're similar and how we're different. I think that what, when one side or one perspective gets left out of the discussion, then we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Then we're in trouble. The default that I've heard from a number of faculty and a number of people in general is this whole notion of the human race and stuff like that. You know that there there is, I don't see color. Well, I just, you know, if you go to there's an implicit what's the implicit association test out of Yale or Harvard that implicit that bias. implicit bias thing uh, uh, where you go online and images flash up and, and you pick is this a positive or negative image mm -hmm. and stuff. You've seen that probably. This notion that you don't see color, I gotta argue with that. I gotta say no. I think you yes, do see you color. Do. You do see color, right. I think I think you, you do. And, and I think that when we work through that, or maybe we were able to get to the other side, but I think that that becomes this default position and it lets us off the hook because it's one of the many things, I've been to a diversity workshop, I don't need to learn anymore. Um, some of my friends are black, I don't need to go to this workshop. Uh, I took Jerry's class, so I'm pretty hip to this stuff, I don't have to worry about it. Uh, I sat in on one of the study circles, I should be fine. This is an ongoing process that lasts for a long time. Um, and I think we gotta be open to this notion of, of community and diversity both, and this notion that I don't think, I don't see color as a good end state for us to end up in. I, I'd like to add one thing, and that is I found really uh, helpful to me reading an article that's uh, readily available online. Uh, it's called Spotting Detours for mm -hmm. White Anti-Racists. Yeah. And it goes through a list, I think it's 17 different commonly held beliefs or things that are commonly said by um, European Americans that are ways of not really dealing with race or racism. And the I don't see color is actually listed as one of those ways of just you know, denying that it's an issue and, and never getting to wrestle with it um, as, as a real lived experience for um, people of color. So it, it might be interesting to folks to maybe look for that, Google it and, and find it. It's mm -hmm. pretty easy to find. And I think there was a, the woman in back in the red shirt, you had a question I think a while back. Oh, okay. She had missed the last of part of your comment. Oh, uh, my last one was that I disagree with Du Bois respectfully. Um, I believe that uh, ultimately we are first animals before we are rational beings. And um, so we identify with such irrational things as skin color. And so that there is a white race. And really what holds that race together in my understanding is, um, yes, there might not be a shared history per se, but a defining moment, I believe, is the scientific revolution, where all of a sudden we could subject the whole um, you know, awe of, of nature and life to our, our, our reason. And, and, and um, anybody who did not think that way was a barbarian and had to be educated 
and, and we train. Um, and so I, I do see that. I can, I can pinpoint it just about in any um, setting that I find myself, so. Question back to. Whoa, it's a. I'm thinking of the title, the unbearness, un unbearable, <laughs> and that evokes a lot in me. I was raised in the whitest country that I think of because it was a country with no uh, colonialism and there was no other colors around. I never saw a different color of people until uh, I left the country, actually. It's not like this now. It, it's all mixed. Uh, I'm talking about Switzerland. I'm talking about Switzerland. I'm closer. <laughs> um, <coughs> and so I have a very naive view about when I was 14 year old, um, we were being asked to uh, at school to write about what our missionary is about. And I honestly wrote a little bit whimsical, but also very serious, that missionaries were uh, people who were going to Africa to learn rhythm that we had lost, so they can bring it back to us. Um, and there's some, I thought about this naive story about when I was 14 year old, uh, often in my life because uh, since I lived in America for all my adult life, uh, I'm seeing the whole question very differently. And I'm, see, ah, God, this is so subtle. The, what Du Bois says, that white is not a race, and then I was thinking, isn't that an example of ideology? Uh, you know, this statement like this. So it keeps us always to talk about it over there. And I feel the whole atmosphere is always talking about this stuff <laughs> in concepts. Everything is kept in concept and here I'm safe. And that is the difference. That is the white thing that has been developed, the European thing that has been, uh, been developed, to project everything in concepts. The rest of the world live in their body. And that's the point about coming back to learn rhythm and to learn to be part of nature. We have uh, objectify nature over there. And to the point of that we are afraid to be dirty, uh, to live with nature, to deal with dirt, etc. Um, and I was just, I happened to be reading uh, a book by an African uh, just this morning, and I was thinking, oh, I'm going to, going to this tonight, and so, and, and the page where I was reading was so appropriate that I just wrote it down. I mean, uh, just a few notes, which is, as a non-Westerner, arriving in this country, in America, for the first time, it is struck by how little attention is given to human emotion in general. People appear to pride themselves for not showing how they feel about anything. As attractive as the modern world is, with its material abundance, it is repulsive with its spiritual and emotional poverty. And that sort of gives a clue about what's wrong with being white. And I felt all my life a sense of deep guilt of the fact of 
that I have a white, well, I'm, no, I agree. I didn't think of myself white, deeply raised in Switzerland. But then when I met other races, I became aware, oh, I'm white, I've got to remember that. And with it came a responsibility of horror, inevitably, because of learning history and how indeed the white people totally exploited the rest of the, the races, and the, uh, as, you, as you know. So it's inevitable to not associate with this. And therefore, is there anything redeeming about being white? has been the question all my life. Uh, and I think that the redeeming aspect, I proposed it once to some Indians in Hopi land, and they appreciated it a lot. <coughs> the white folks who were present was furious. But uh, I think the gift of white is to transcend altogether the idea of being a society, a race, indeed, a, 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 an ongoing thing that we win, a culture. What is this culture? Because this culture, indeed, is, has lost its, as, its association with being part of nature and part of the spirit. Everything has become a concept. They don't know who they are anymore uh, here. It has to be conceptualized. Otherwise, it's n we, we, there, there's nothing there. There's, a, there's an emptiness that has to be filled with, I don't know, with cars and uh, furniture and uh, romance and, and drugs, uh, whatever. I mean, that's, that's the history. What is the fact of the white race at this time? And, uh, anyway, so what I propose to the Indian is, uh, is the idea of the individual. <coughs> that is a whole new I say, gift that came from Europe. And there are very few who know it. I mean, it comes from very specific people like Jung or, uh, you know, antennas that have been transcending this whole white race to a point of is there anything redeeming about it? And it can, I don't, and I agree, it cannot be a race. It ha we have, the gift is to become an individual <coughs> beyond, <coughs> so I was thinking of the title of tonight, which is the unbearableness, no, the, uh, the <laughs> of being, <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not white. It's not, it's, wrong, it's the wrong word. We are all, we are being. It is, being is being, it's a great mystery. I cannot, we cannot conceptualize being, <coughs> beingness. We must not concept, and this is where the white race falls. I mean the white, the whole so-called false culture that has been doing what? Destroying the planet. And that's where it is at now. That's why I'm having a certain urgency about all this. It can be talked about. It is something very crucial now with a, s and a sense of urgency that should really disturb us physically, give us fever. Uh, in, an emotional fever about the whole question that you presented and I thank you very much for what you all mm -hmm. for you. Just have one more question. We gotta wrap things up here. I think the, there, there was, was yeah, a hand, she had there. hand up. He's had his I'm hand not up. sure who was oh, first. I think over here with <laughs> can duke it out. <laughs> all right. Um I understand over time but I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this as quickly as possible. Um this is a topic on uh, race relations and equality that hasn't been very much discussed in tonight's discussion. But uh, to get things clear, that I'm very pro-equality. And uh, something that I'd like to bring up was um, just something within the past decade was in the state of California when uh, Gray Davis was in, um, was in office. The 
the Congress decided to implement a system, not implement, I'm sorry, to dis discontinue the affirmative action policy. And uh, according to um, a book, Hating Whitey by David Horowitz, um, a large portion of the African community called it a step back in history and um, a racist act towards uh, the black community. Um, they also, the book also stated that the campaign to oppose the discontinuing of affirmative action, um, they flew in a former KKK leader to address the audience saying this is, you know, like I said, a step back in history and it is a racist act. And um, well, my point is, does affirmative action, is it, is it a good message that is sending into uh, all minorities that, you know, white people that you have to work this hard, whereas minorities you can work this hard, but it's still you'll get accepted to educational institutions as well as corporations. And um, for the sake of equality, um, should America prohibit racial preferences such as college funds <coughs> and uh, clubs and organizations for corporations and educational institutions? And is it necessarily a bad thing to not see color and see the inequalities and the effort put forth by the individual? And this is uh, directed to all of you guys, and uh, I'd like to hear your take on any from yeah, any of Yeah, maybe I can start a little bit and then I'll open it because I think that there's a lot to speak to that. Um, there's a really great article by uh, George Lipsitz called The Possessive Investment of Whiteness. And I think that one thing that he does really well in that article is really sort of outline how there's been a historical culture, a systemic sort of reinforcement of privilege, which we're all addressing here, right, in terms of economy, in terms of um, housing, in terms of rights, and all these sorts of things that have sort of uh, privileged over a course of history uh, white folk, right? And so um, in the face of this uh, very long-term systemic uh, support for this one particular racial identity, um, we have now these sorts of small gains that are being made, right, mostly within the past 60 years even, right, civil rights movement, and these sorts of changes that are happening to address a long period of wrongs, right? And so I think things like affirmative action sort of offer these m small sort of glimpses where the system is sort of trying to be righted, right? To make up for these uh, long histories, these genealogies, these, um, uh, for example, histories of people that have had access to, uh, to education, right? And uh, so, you know, to ask whether or not it is um, unfair at this point whether or not one group is being privileged over others. Uh, it's instead maybe asking the question, where is privilege? How do we really define privilege? Is it something that's more about immediate, uh, the immediacy of the, the situation, or is it something about a long-term issue? For example, um, I don't know, I, I, we, I haven't talked about this with anybody, but we might think about how many of us in this group um, are first-generation college students, right? Would we define privilege, I think, to own all of our own privilege, right, um, as educated people? Uh, where does that privilege in our family lines start? Does it start with my generation, as in my case where I'm a first generation college student, or does it start you know, further back uh, with multiple generations for any one of us? And you know, how do we as a contemporary culture start to address these very long term wrongs? Um, so that's where I would say, and I think that maybe somebody else could speak to the, to the uh, specificity of legalities and things like that, but that would be one thing I would uh, urge you to look at George Lipsis's account of that. <coughs> Oh, okay. Um, affirmative action is a remedy. It is intended to be a narrowly tailored remedy to um, address past wrongs. If you take the position that it is no longer needed, and I'm not sure that's the position you're taking, um, then you are in effect saying that the, le the playing field is now level. Everybody has an equal chance. And I don't believe that's true. Um, I think that people often confuse affirmative action with quotas, which it's not, uh, and also with um, the idea that if you admit a person of color, for example, to an educational program, uh, as a, an affirmative action type uh, admit that you're letting in somebody who's less qualified than a white applicant who doesn't get the opportunity. And affirmative action is not about lesser qualification. I think there is some stigma associated with being perceived as someone who, quote, took advantage of affirmative action. Um, 
and and so that's a concern and I know some people who have declined to identify themselves as being anything other than white if they can you know appear to be or, or to not invoke uh, uh, or list their race because they don't want that stigma um, that doesn't mean their uh, task isn't uh, a, a more difficult one than someone who is um, of European American descent and I think you really you asked a whole bunch of different questions um, in your remarks and I'm not sure that um, we can give uh, sound bites that would really address those issues but I think they're important ones to talk <coughs> about and if you can find venues where you can talk about it further I would definitely encourage you to do that are you gonna jump in here because I want to go before you because you know more about this no go ahead <laughs> I'm an education prof, but I don't necessarily deal with higher education policy, and, and uh, Dr. Pratt has. Um, I, I want to give the answer that accepts the terms of the current debate to the question about affirmative action, and then I want to give the answer, which is actually my understanding of how these policies actually came into being, not how they get rationalized publicly. Um, the first is objections that affirmative action policies, because they are built to give extra points to somebody on a test score, um, is therefore an unequal policy or doesn't actually advance inequality is premised on the really problematic notion that those tests actually measure people equally and are, in fact, any sort of rational or reliable measure of somebody's um, ability to contribute to a college community or benefit from that education. That's simply false. The actual correlation between SAT scores and what people do with their careers and whether they graduate is really, really weak. We probably shouldn't be using those tests but because they're cheap, like cheaper than sitting down and interviewing everybody and making some sort of really complicated moral assessment of who's worthy of an education, we let the tests do that work for us, which kind of gets back to your point that the scientific, uh, um, the scientific revolution creates an ideology that allows us to dehumanize people and then we can call them all the same and that being whiteness. There's a relationship here. So if you're gonna say that affirmative action is at some level unequal because it involves giving extra point boosts here or there, and that's fundamentally unequal. That's premised on the idea that those tests are actually fair and equal, and they're not. Okay, so that's accepting the terms of the debate, but my understanding is that affirmative action isn't designed to redress past wrongs. It's not a moral compensation, not the way it actually came into being. Um, I, I, in a very weird way, I found myself on the affirmative, the faculty of Senate Affirmative Action Committee as an undergraduate at Texas A&M University. I was in the student senate. They needed a faculty rep a student representative on this committee for some reason, so they picked me. Um, and what I learned in that committee was really valuable to me, is that there was a federal mandate for Texas A&M at that point to have a more diverse student body, more representative of the state, but also an overall conception that if the state of Texas did not successfully educate its African American and its Latino population, then you would have and increasing stratification, not just across class differences but across race, it would be a political and social problem for the entire state. So there's an imperative for the entire state and for the nation to educate everyone so that our ideal and our illusion of a meritocratic society could be maintained. A very reactionary conservative agenda is, is advanced by having a, a pool of citizens that can be pointed to as successful so we can point all the other people that aren't successful and say, see, it's your own damn fault. Right, so that's why we need to have a mixed group at the university going on to good middle class careers. Now, the way the universities choose to deal with that is they compete through affirmative action scholarships for the suburban, highly assimilated, assimilated students of color all over Texas. So people didn't want to go down to the Rio Grande Valley and find people who do not code switch into standard English. They wanted to go to the suburbs of Houston and Dallas and find people who were code switchers or spoke standard English, et cetera, and were already very able to come into a university community and not disturb the normative culture there. <clears throat> so affirmative action protects the university from having to change to deal with actual diversity. We will have real diversity here when we bring people in whose cultural discourses and um, registers of speech and registers of thought are very different and we engage them as equals. We have never gotten anywhere near that. And affirmative action is actually a way to avoid doing it. So go ahead and dismantle affirmative action, which I'm not in support of, but you're going to find yourself back to the same set of problems that faced a society that doesn't want to deal with the real substance of diversity and invented affirmative action to avoid dealing with it. So 
that's the more. Uh, <clears throat> I'll touch on it real quick. It, and you should be interested, uh, my office, Institutional Equity and Diversity, is hosting a panel series just on affirmative action in the fall. So look for that. I'll do a little uh, tooting of my own horn on that one. Uh, it, and it's been my experience that uh, as far as university policies on affir affirmative action, uh, legally, we can't hire you because you're black. Um, you know, wh what the institution has been able to do is been able to rationalize using additional dollars to bring those people who traditionally aren't at the table to the table for the discussion of would you like to come to the university for uh, as a faculty member, would you like to come here as a student. Uh, so it, it, as far as the, the notion that the people who are actually coming here, um, people of color who aren't don't have the credentials to, to make it, uh, completely false. So what those dollars have been able to do is bring those um, very smart, very um, dedicated persons to the table so that we can at least engage them and, and bring them here or wherever else. Uh, well, just to, uh, I also happen to be in the Dean's Office of the College of Arts and Sciences this year. And just to echo what um, AJ and Jerry said, um, the, the university, for example, uh, treats affirmative action as a very narrow policy that has to do particularly with hiring and there's, you know, there are guidelines and so forth. But diver the diversity issue is a much broader thing and it's about doing what Jerry said, which is to bring people from different perspectives in because there's something that we gain from having these sorts of conversations and to, to, to uh, <coughs> encourage folks by way of providing resources, admission opportunities, um, uh, faculty hiring practices that that reach out to include more faculty in the searches and so forth. These are all part not of uh, redressing wrongs, so that's part of ultimately what happens. It's actually about in just engaging diversity because that's how the world is, and that our sort of flourishing depends on our being able to do that. So I mean, this is this is I think what's behind the the university diversity plan. It's not about just establishing affirmative action in a legal sense. It's actually about diversifying, making the university a different place. I think it's also about improving the educational experience of all students. And there's a book uh, I forget the name of the authors. I should know better. Uh, the Shape of the River, which <coughs> did an extensive study of uh, college students. Um, paying attention to uh, the diversity um, across uh, several college campuses and finding that students um, of color and, and uh, European American students felt that they had received a better education, the more diverse racially that they were um, than those that were in um, mostly white campuses and educational situations. You, you don't have the breadth and richness and, and diversity of experiences, culture. Um, if you tend to be an all-white institution, or mostly, that you do if you um, do some outreach to, to bring others who haven't traditionally been at the institution to the table to, to go through that educational experience together. <coughs> and so they also found that the students of color in those colleges in fact, did well um, that it wasn't a situation of bringing in people who were not qualified. I mean, that's the stigma thing again. Is that you know, if you're a person of color, you must be here only because of affirmative action, not because you deserve to. And you took some more deserving white person's place in in doing that. And and that's a, a, a false. Um, it's a myth. Uh, and I think that the book also indicated that the students of color who graduated turned out to be more active in their communities, uh, in the communities generally, in terms of uh, giving back to community, um, and uh, tended to be uh, successful in their endeavors after they graduated. So that, that's another um, perspective on affirmative action. And I, it, it also brings to mind one thing that Tim Wise has um, said, and, and that is, uh, he gives an example of, does anybody, has anybody ever complained about the legacy uh, admits, the, those who have parents or grandparents who have previously attended a university 
getting uh, that their children get a leg up in some form or fashion, uh, or <coughs> if their parents have donated lots of money to to the university, do their children get special consideration of some sort that um, displaces somebody else? So uh, again, goes back to that idea of this is not exactly a meritocracy, and until it is, we need to be doing something uh, to get it to a point where it can be. we've gone long past our concluding time. I apologize to those of you who didn't have a chance to ask questions, but uh, I appreciate the attendance tonight. The community conversations really depend on your engagement, your intellectual curiosity, your courage to discuss these questions. I'd like to in invite you to, to thank the panelists for a wonderful... And for, I'd, I'd, I'd like to pose just one small hypothetical, <laughs> and, and it, this is what keeps me up at night, and so I want to share the burden with all of you. <laughs> um, so, and it directly tags on to what we're doing. So if you were to take... Uh, transplant, I don't know, five, ten people, um, whether it be white, black, Latino, uh, it could even be Mexican, Nigerian, if you were to take them uh, from birth and move them, let's say, to Mars to have them create their own kind of society, um, what keeps me up at night is thinking, would they perpetuate the same types of stratification that we have here? Would be things be completely different? Uh, how would their society uh, evolve, develop? Um, it's just something that keeps me going. I, my answer to that changes almost <laughs> daily, so um, enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks again.